So today is Thursday, the January 17th, 18th, it's the Thursday, okay, the 18th, and you can see this is the uh, last slide that we covered, we covered watts. The next subject we're going to cover is magnetic fields, fields made out of magnetism. And I want to talk about those magnetic fields, those those lines of flux. At the moment, I can't. I don't understand why that other screen's not working. And is it working? There we go. Now it's working. So when I say these lines of flux have polarity. I'm talking about one has a north pole and one has a south pole. So if here's a magnet, one side's going to have a north pole, the other side's going to have a south pole. And the lines of flux come out of one side and they go into the other. They come out of one side and then they go into the other. They come out of one side and then they go into the other. They come out of one side and then they go into the other. Oh, and they go through the magnet too, sorry. And these lines of flux attract ferrous metals. When I say ferrous metals, I'm talking about iron, cobalt, and nickel. Hopefully that's farther on the slide. Look, there it is. There's magnets have north poles and they have south poles, and opposite poles attract. So if I had two magnets, north and south, and I put them together like this, south and north, this north and south would be attracted and it, they would be pulled together and get closer. If I drew two magnets like this, north and south, and south and north, they would repel each other. So opposite poles attract and like poles repel. Ta -da. And so that's how you can make a mag, a motor, is on the inside of the motor you have magnets that either pull something around or push something around or both at the same time. It's just that in electric motors, we're going to use electricity and run it through a wire to create the magnet. So this one is important. How strong a magnet is, is determined by how many lines of flux are in a given volume. So for instance, if I take a different color here, and I take one cubic foot, or correction, one one, uh, one cubic inch right there. Yeah, how many lines of flux are inside of that cubic inch? Somebody say four. No, three. No, that's not right. Four. Okay, there you go. And I do one cubic foot inch right here. How many cubic lines of flux are going through that? Don't say two. Two. Okay, so here we have two lines of flux. See, there's one. And there's another one, so that's two. And there we have one, two, three, four. So we already have four. So this magnet is stronger at the end. It's stronger at the poles because the lines of flux are concentrated. Another way to say wherever the lines of flux are more concentrated, that's where the magnet will be the strongest. So you can change, for instance, how many uh, paper clips you pick up. So if I have a magnet right here, here's north and here's south, and here's my lines of flux, and I have a magnet right here, here's north and south, and, I, and it's the same strength magnet. Got to change colors here. Blue. If I can pick up one paper clip here, then I'm probably going to be able to pick up two paper clips here. Even though it's the same magnet, at certain places on the magnet, there's more lines of flux in the same the lines of flux are concentrated. Question. What about the magnet? What if What if it's a circular magnet? You mean like uh, like a donut hole? You're saying a magnet like this, and so this is north, and this is south. I've never seen this kind of magnet. I'm not saying they don't exist, but... If I if I look if I looked at it from the side, and here's the dotted lines to show that there's a hole in the middle, I'm going to guess that the lines of flux 
come out of this pole and go into here. And this here's the line of flux that goes into there. And here's the line of flux that go into there. And here's the lines of flux that go like that. That would be my guess. So I would guess you would be able to pick up a lot of paper clips in the middle or a lot of paper clips on the edge because that's where the lines of flux are concentrated. But I can't swear this is how the lines of flux are on a donut type magnet. I've eaten a lot of donuts, but none of them were made out of permanently magnetizable material. They were generally made out of wheat flour and lots and lots of sugar. And and those kind of donuts don't pick up mag don't pick up paper clips. So if you look on the periodic table of elements, the three major elements that can be permanently magnetized or turn in, turned into a magnet and then they stay a magnet are iron and cobalt and nickel. Cobalt and nickel are much, much more expensive than iron is. So you're going to find the vast majority of inexpensive magnets are made out of iron. Now, if you really want it to be permanently magnetized, you need to contaminate the iron with a little bit of carbon. Like graphite in your pencil lead is made out of carbon. So if you melt the, metal, the iron down and you sprinkle in really, 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 really small carbon particles like ashes and stir it around really good, and I'm oversimplifying, I'm not a metallurgist, and I don't smelt metal. I've smelled hot metal, but I've never smelt it. Smelt. Has anybody ever been a metal smelter? Okay, someone has smelt metal. I'm not making this up. I know you think I'm making it up. Smelt, that's when you melt down iron ore to try to get iron off of it or try to make it more pure than it was. You've, you've been a smelt, you've smelted? Cool. He was a smelter? Is that on his tombstone? You don't, hopefully he's alive and it's not on his tombstone. Okay, good. Sorry. All right. So if somebody ever says, hey, can I magnetize titanium? You can go, no, uh now, if somebody put some iron, cobalt, or nickel inside of the titanium, all right. Can you magnetize gold? No. Can you magnetize silver? No. Can you magnetize copper? Not permanently. None of these things are permanently magnetizable. And again, if you want iron, cobalt, or nickel to be magnetized, you've got to put some impurity in it. And carbon is generally the one that gets put in it. So if you want iron to be permanently magnetized, you've got to put some, some carbon in it. Guess what we call iron that has carbon in it? We call it... Steel. Adding a little bit of, I know, you're putting your head on your hands. That's crazy, huh? Yeah, you put uh, cobalt, you put carbon in iron, and it turns it into steel. Iron is softer than steel is. It's stronger. It's a little bit more brittle, but it's stronger. So you're going to find steel used in cars and in airplanes and most other purposes to be strong. They've put carbon in it, and you don't have to memorize this number, but about 3% is a pretty typical steel, so it's 3% carbon. And now it's a lot stronger. And now, fortunately or unfortunately, you can turn it into a magnet, a permanent magnet. Question? How can you increase the strength of a magnet? Well, if it's a permanent magnet, not an electromagnet caused by electricity, which is what we're going to talk about here in a minute. But if it's a permanent magnet, the way you make it is you take a really strong magnet and you touch it up and hold it against the piece of steel. Magnet, but you hit the steel with the hammer, and the electron rotation inside the, on the molecules line up. Yes, the rotation of the electrons line up. So, and if you don't know what that means, don't feel bad, because this isn't a physics class. Then you pull the magnet away, and the steel has some magnetism. So if you want it to be stronger, you put it next to an even stronger magnet and hit it even more. And take the magnet away, and, this, and this, now this steel will be stronger than it was before. I'm, I'm, over, I'm oversimplifying it, but I've done it. I've taken screwdrivers that I want to be able to pick up screws. 
and I put a magnet on it, and I hit the, the screwdriver, the metal part of the screwdriver with the hammer a bunch of times, and then, uh, and then it'll pick up screws. So I don't know if there's a name for that, a, magne a magnetizer. Yes, I... Huh? It's pretty... It's permanent, yeah. Not in, Am I lying? In this case, the answer is no. But thank you for thinking that I might be deceiving you. Do you know why? Do, am I lying about lying? <laughs> you're, you're, doing, you're doing great, Josh. You're doing great. If I said, no, I'm not lying about lying, could I not, though, therefore be lying? And if I said I was lying about lying, that means I would be telling the truth. But if I was lying, how could I be telling the truth? So there, so there is a bit of a paradox here. Maybe a conundrum, if you will. Or a quandary. Do you like quandaries over conundrums, or do you like conundrums over quandaries? Yeah, I know, it's a paradox. All right, so now I want to talk about electromagnets. Electromagnets are magnets that are made from pushing electrons through a wire. You may recall from several days ago that two things happen to a conductor or a wire when electrons go through it. One, the, electron, the conductor gets hotter. Some of the electrical energy is used up in the wire, and the wire gets hotter. The second thing that happens is you get lines of flux surrounding that wire, surrounding that conductor. So now there's a lot of ways to change the strength of an electromagnet. So, so this is just a repeat here. Any conductor, and if you'd rather write the word wire, that's okay. Anything that has electrons going through it gives off uh, uh, lines of flux. So if you get struck by lightning... At the moment, the electrons are traveling through you. You could pick paper clips with your bare foot without grasping them with your toes because you would be an electromagnet just for a very short period of time. Electromagnets are only magnetic while the electricity is flowing. As soon as the electrons stop, the lines of flux collapse down to zero. Same thing, the opposite occurs when you turn on the electricity. When you turn on the electricity, the lines of flux start in the middle of the wire, and they expand out to as big as they're going to get. It takes a certain amount of time. And, of course, most of the conductors that we use in airplanes and cars are copper and aluminum, and cars have a lot of iron, but there are some, like, engine mounts on airplanes that we run electricity through, and they're made out of... Actually, out of, I'm, I'm, you can leave iron in there, but it's probably really just it's steel. So I want, to, I want to get a point across here. So let's say that here is a wire or a conductor. And now we start pumping electrons through it. What's going to happen is in the center of the wire, the line of flux is going to form. And it's going to get, we're going to get more and more and more lines of flux. So you could argue that this line of flux here, it starts in the center and expands outward. The line of flux starts in the center and expands outward, and other ones join it underneath it. And this takes time for the line of flux to go from zero to fully expanded. It's a really, really short amount of time. We may not be able to see it with the human eye, but it's measurable with electronic devices. Then when you turn the electricity off, well, let me back up. So what I'm trying to get uh, across here is when you turn on the electricity, it's not instantaneous that the lines of flux appear. They start in the center of the wire, and they expand outward. It takes way less than a tenth of a second, less than a, a hundredth of a second, maybe less than a thousandth of a second. But it takes time to expand from the center of the wire to full size. And then they just sit there while the electricity is moving. As soon as you turn the switch off, they don't instantaneously disappear either. They collapse from how big they are. They collapse back down to zero in the center of the wire. So those lines of flux are actually moving outward for, and then stay there until all this, you know, 10 minutes or however long you leave the electricity on. And then when you turn it off, the lines of flux collapse back down to zero. So what do you think is happening? So if we had this hooked up to to a battery in a DC system. We turn the switch on, the lines of flux collapse, it sits there, <laughs> 10 minutes or whatever, we leave the lights on, 
And then we close the switch, and the lines of flux collapse. No problem. Here's a thought. What if it's alternating current? In alternating current, remember, in household current, this whole, this whole time right here is 1 60th of a second. So as the, as the electrons are going from zero to their highest level, these lines of flux are going to be expanding. But then the electron flow gets less and less back down to zero. The lines of flux will collapse. And then the lines of flux, then the electrons go in the other direction. That just means the polarity of the lines of flux, instead of the, the lines of flux being like this, now the lines of flux are going to be in the opposite direction. So the polarity changes, but the lines of flux expand to their maximum. And then as it goes from maximum back to zero, the lines of flux will collapse again, and then it'll start all over. So if you put a compass next to a DC wire and you turned it on, the compass would move a certain amount and then it would stop. And then when you turned off the electricity, the compass would move back to where it originally was. But in an AC circuit, it'd be going back and forth and back and forth. It'd go one direction for a 30th of a second and another direction for a 30th of a second and, and then start over again one direction for a 30th of a second, and then the other for a 30th of a second. So if you're changing the electron flow from zero to maximum, and then maximum down to zero, lines of flux will expand, and then they'll collapse. So on this computer, you can't see it way over there, but you look at this gizmo right here on this, com on this monitor, this what looks like a black cylinder on it. There's actually something in there trying to dampen those lines of flux and make it less because those lines of flux, what if those lines of flux are now going and crossing components inside the monitor? It could cause the monitor to not work correctly. So whether a magnet is a permanent magnet or the magnet is made, at, made because of electricity, an electromagnet, it doesn't matter. They still have lines of flux, and they will still try to pick up ferrous metals like iron, cobalt, or nickel, and they will still interact with each other. That is, the north pole of a permanent magnet will attract the south pole of an electromagnet, or the north pole of an electromagnet will attract the south pole of a permanent magnet. So it, and electromagnets will attract or repel other electromagnets. So it doesn't matter whether it's a permanent magnet or an electromagnet, it's still going to do the same thing. Did I lose anybody there? All right. So permeability is where do these lines of flux want to be? Where do they want to go? Lines of flux would rather flow or travel through a substance that it's easy for them to travel. Air is not that good of, uh, of uh, does not have high permeability. It has low permeability. But iron has really, really high permeability. So a line of flux, if it has a choice, it'll go through a piece of iron instead of a piece of air. So let's just say that I uh, take a wire and I roll it up in a coil. And for fun, we'll put a battery on it. And so as soon as I connect everything, I'm going to get what? If I run electricity through a wire, what two things are going to happen? I'm going to ask you this on the test a week from Tuesday. What is it? We're going to get lines of flux, and the wire is going to get hotter than it was. Okay. And these lines of flux on a coil of wire are going to look like that. And I could draw more in there. However, if I decided that I wanted to concentrate my lines of flux, and I took a piece of steel, and I put a piece of iron, or cobalt or nickel, but iron is cheaper, and I stuck some iron in there, these lines of flux would go to a different place. These lines of flux would now go 
and almost all of them would stay inside the iron. So the lines of flux would have moved, would have stayed in closer, and this concentrates the lines of flux. So one way to make an electrolyte stronger is to concentrate the flux by shoving in an iron core into the middle of those wires, and now you get, it concentrates the lines of flux, so you get a strong It does weigh a little bit because you got a little more because you got iron, but it doesn't take any more electricity. So what you're going to find is on electromagnets, the vast majority of the time, it's going to be a coil of wire, but they have shoved a core of soft iron in there. And when I say the word soft iron, equals no carbon. Because what happens to iron if you put carbon in it? It gets harder. So if there's no carbon in it, Compared to steel, it is, if there's no carbon in it, it's, it's softer. So that way, that iron in there doesn't become a permanent magnet. Because what we want to have happen here is we want to be able to have a switch. And we want to be able to turn this electromagnet on and off and on and off. If it was steel in there with carbon and it was hard iron, it would slowly get magnetized and then it would never turn itself off. So electromagnets are almost always, or they are always, made out of soft iron, so they don't become permanently magnetized. So there, I just covered hard iron versus soft iron. Hard iron, retentivity. Retentivity is how much lines of flux will something hold on to after you take the magnetizing force away. The reason I could magnetize that screwdriver is it was made out of steel. It had iron with carbon in it. Screwdrivers are usually made out of steel because iron's too pure iron is too soft. So it was hard iron or steel because it had carbon in it. So I could make that screwdriver retain magnetism or keep the magnetism. So if I make something out of pure cobalt, pure nickel, or pure iron, it's going to have zero retentivity. You can pick it up with a magnet. You can turn it into a magnet if you want to. But if you take the magnetic force away, all the lines of flux are going to disappear. It has zero retentivity. If I put impurities in it, in particular with iron, you put carbon in it, now it has high retentivity. And of course, I just showed you an example of where you would want a piece of iron that helps you with an electromagnet, but you want that piece of iron to have low retentivity. You don't want it to retain any magnetism. As far as anything else, the answer is nope, never. Those are just examples. Wood. I could have put wood on there. You can't pick up, it, let's put it this way, if you can't pick it up with a magnet, it's always going to have zero retentivity. If you can't, so can you pick up aluminum with a magnet, titanium with a magnet, copper, gold, magnesium, lead? No, you can't pick up any of those things with a magnet. And therefore, they will also have zero retentivity. You cannot magnetize them. We having fun yet? Those of you that didn't come in here at 120, you missed me singing. So if anybody wants me to repeat that song, just let me know. I'll stand right next to Jaron and sing it. Isn't that right, Jaron? Okay, if you want a strong electromagnet, there's four ways to do it, Rodrigo. On the test, there'll be a question. Name five of the four different ways you can change the strength of an electromagnet. And you'll write down four out of the five, and then you'll get one wrong. Just like all the other tests I've previously written. That's how I like to write test questions. And four out of five. Those are, those are my favorite questions. Pardon me? Well, that's true. Well, get your hopes up. I might remember when I'm writing the test, and I'll make it real hard.
So if you want to have a stronger electromagnet, one way to make it stronger is to put in more windings. So let's just say I have enough amperage going through the here that I have one line of flux around each wire. If I wrap this wire around here once, two, three, four, five times, and here I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times, each one of these wires is going to have a line of flux, but it's going to add on to the next. And I did, it doesn't show it very well. It's going to add on. I'm going to have five lines of flux, and here I'm going to have ten lines of flux. So if I doubled the number of windings, two times the windings is going to equal two times the strength. That's one way to do it. Same amount of electricity. Question. Yeah, if I have twice as many windings, I'll have twice the electrons. Obviously, another way to get the magnet stronger is to pump more amps through it. I could have two coils that were exactly the same, and if I push twice as many electrons through one of them, it'll have twice as much magnetism. I can pick up twice as many paper clips. I can also do it with the shape. So, for instance, if I have wires like this, or I have the exact same wires like this, the same number of windings, this one's going to be stronger because the lines of flux will be closer together. Here, the lines of flux will be all spread out. So this one concentrates it better than right here. And then permeable core, I already showed you that example. If you stuff in a piece of soft iron, cobalt, or nickel, then these lines of flux will move in and it will concentrate them. The good news here is that as pilots, or I should say as mechanics, as mechanics, the number of windings, the engineer figured it out. The shape of the windings, whether or not there's a permeable core, the engineer figured it out. This is the one that we're going to deal with as an aircraft mechanic. If that electromagnet has the correct amount of amps going to it, then it ought to be strong enough. If for some reason not enough electricity, not enough amps is going to it, then it won't be strong enough. So this is the only one that we really have to deal with. But now you're, applied, you're going to be applied physicist, so you had to know all that stuff. But Mr. Johnson, I don't want to be an applied physicist. All right. Electromagnetic induction. All right, so let's talk about electromagnetic induction. If I take a coil of wire and I take a magnet and I make it so I can rotate this magnet and make it spin, so the magnet spins. And I'm going to say that it has lines of flux. that when it spins, the lines of flux cross the wires. Whenever these lines of flux cross the wires, it's going to induce, hence the word induction, it's going to induce a current flow. Ah, I accidentally erased it. All right, fine. If it is spinning and the lines of flux are crossing the wire, it's going to induce a current flow through the wire. Actually, the current flows like this. It's going to induce current flow. You've got to remember, let's back up. If I push electrons through a wire, I get a little bit of heat, and I also get lines of flux. So I turn the wire into a magnet. Where does the power for the magnet come from? from the electrons going through it. The exact opposite is true. If I push a line of flux through a wire, now I get electrons. So it's doing the same thing backwards. One way to 
add electrons, and you get lines of flux. Here, we have lines of flux crossing the wire. It gives us electrons. Now, the key part of the key here is the only time it'll make the electrons move and have current and have amps is while the lines of flux are moving across the wire. As soon as you stop the magnet, no more current is getting pushed. The amps go to zero. So you have to keep it spinning. This is the basic theory of operation of generators and alternators. That's why alternators are spun by belts hooked up to car engines. And alternators are spun by belts hooked onto airplane and helicopter engines. Because we have to keep the magnet spinning so it crosses wires and generates electrical power. So if you want the output of this alternator, and I, this is not the exact uh, diagram of an alternator, but we're going to say it's close enough for the moment. So here's the output here. And let's say this, this is output, so we would want to put that to the negative side of the battery. So now the alternator would charge the battery. Score. If we spin this thing fast enough, we can get it to put out a high enough voltage to do exactly that. So if you want this to put out more amps, you want to have this alternator put out more electrical power, the way to do it is to either go faster or you have more lines of flux. Let's put in a stronger magnet. If we put in a stronger magnet, hey there, four o'clock. If we put in a stronger magnet, we'd have more lines of flux, and so now these lines of flux would be crossing the wire. If we doubled our lines of flux, we would double how many electrons that we would cause to move. So, as mechanics, we cannot change how many how uh, how many lines. We can't change either of these. However, the system can. If the alternator is bolted to the engine, then the alternator is going to change speed when the engine changes speed. So what do you expect? If the engine is spinning lower, slower, the engine is spinning fast, which condition can we get more power out of the alternator? If the alternator is spinning fast. And then the other one, lines of flux. There's a thing called a regulator that decides how strong the magnet is. And we're not going to get into that because we don't have all semester. We have to be done with electrical lecture today. Isn't that terrible? So electromagnetic induction, or EMI, is how you can produce electrical power. If you want to produce electrical power, you have to make electrons move in a wire. You have to make amps flow. And the way to do that is you have to have lines of flux that cross wires or cross conductors. As long as the lines of flux are crossing the wire, you will make electrons move in that wire, and you'll have be generating electricity. The moment you stop the lines of flux from moving, you will stop the electrons from moving. So the alternator, does it put out any electricity when it stops? No, okay, so that's why, because now the lines of flux aren't crossing the wire. Now, if you want this electromagnetic induction device to put out more electrical power, you've got to do one of two things. Either have, make it have more lines of flux, which means make the magnet stronger, or you've got to spin it faster. Those are the only two ways you can make it faster. Now, the way I'm going to give you one slight difference here, in an alternator... See if I can do this. I think I can. I think I can. There we go. In an alternator, 
instead of having a permanent magnet, it's an electromagnet. Now, if this right here is an electromagnet, what can we do to that to make it have more lines of flux or have less lines of flux? Well, that's true. We could make it have more windings, but we've already built the alternator and installed it on the airplane. What's the one thing as airplane mechanics on an electromagnet that can change once it's been designed and, and put on the aircraft? That can change the strength of that electromagnet. Four things. What's the one thing that can change? Well, it's just the electromagnet, not the alternator. Just the, the electro. Add more amps or take away more amps. That's correct. So we can't make the windings a different shape. It's already built. We can't put in an iron core or take one out. It's already built and installed on the aircraft. We can't put more windings on it. It's already built on the aircraft. The only thing in this alternator that you can do to change how many lines of flux are crossing the, that blue wire on the left is by changing how strong the electromagnet is. And the only way you can change the strength of the electromagnet is by ha changing how many amps go through it. So if you change how many amps go through it by pumping more electricity through it, the alternator will put out more power. So we're actually going to do this next week. On Monday in lab. All this electrical, this is how many hours and hours and hours. It feels like hundreds of hours of electrical that work. This is how long it took me to get you to know how an alternator works. I know, it's, it's tough, isn't it? There's a few extra things in there that will come in handy. But on Monday, we're each, every two people is going to have an alternator, and we're going to put on a tech stand, and we're going to run it. And we're going to rotate a knob that allows more or less electrons into this electromagnet and creates more or less lines of flux and impacts these wires and either puts out more electricity or less electricity, and we're going to measure it in amps. And we're going to see if our alternator is any good. Then we're going to disassemble the alternator just like we would if we were an aircraft mechanic or an automobile mechanic. And we're going to test each of the components inside of the alternator. We're going to test the electromagnet. We're going to test that coil there on the left that the electrons are moving in. We're going to test those to see if we wrong if we were taking an alternator apart to fix it. There's a couple of other components in there that we're going to get to. And then we're going to put it all back together again, and then we're going to put it back on the test stand to see if we put it back correctly. Let's take a break. I tell you what, oh, I got one more thing to cover and then we're going to take a break. It'll be better if we cover this now. Now here's what's fun. Let's say, for instance, that at this moment this is the north pole of the magnet and this is the south pole of the magnet and it's rotating around in the middle. When this north pole crosses these wires, it induces the current to flow in one direction. That's when the North Pole goes past it. But when the South Pole comes around, it's the opposite polarity. So when the South Pole comes around, it's going to push electrons in the opposite direction. So that wouldn't work out to charge this battery because the battery needs electricity pushed into it in only one direction. So what kind of electricity, if we hooked up something to this coil right here, this circuit, and half the time the electrons are going in one direction, and half the time the electrons are going in the opposite direction, what kind of power is this? AC, very good. It's alternating current. But in cars and little airplanes, we need DC to charge the battery. We need DC to power our components. So what we have to do is make these electrons only go in one way. So there's going to be an, uh, an extra component, and we're going to test this in our alternators. Here is a diode. You know what? 
I drew it in the wrong place. If I put a diode in here, diode is a really screwy symbol. The way I look at it is if this arrow comes up against this line, it hits a brick wall. Electrons cannot go in that direction. Electrons can only go opposite the direction of the arrow. So this electronic device, these north pole electrons try to come up here, they'll stop. But when the south pole comes around, it will allow electrons to flow in this direction. So now we'll only have electrons flowing in one direction. I'm not going to get into the details, but there's a way to hook up six of these diodes and make those, these electrons that stop, there's a way to make them all go in the same direction. So we're going to be testing at least these three items. We're going to test this coil that spins around. We're going to test this coil of wire that's stationary. And we're going to test the diodes to make sure that they're converting the alternating current into direct current. Now let's take a break until 21 after. Don't worry, at 21 after, we only have 49 minutes left of lecture for today. Yeah, 39 minutes. I'm at 39. Yeah, we're going to lecture until 10 after.